welcome our hometown publishers. Today's office hours. joining us on uh, Labor Day today. Thank you so much for taking some time out. I uh, wanted to kick it off with a little jam. I was just relaxing, playing some music uh, beforehand. So uh, kind of an idea I'm toying with of organizing a, a virtual um, concert with uh, some journalists and publishers that we work with. If you're interested in that, let me know. It's just an idea right now. But uh, Let's kick this off. So let's see who we got. Um, we got, uh, we got, uh, we got uh, Vera, but I might be getting a little bit of feedback there, Vera. Sounded, well, that might be my guitar. Um, it's okay. Sorry about that. Ready. I had to mute the audio. Oh. oh, okay. Gotcha. Oh, but did you take a phone call or something? Oh, I think there might be. I don't know. You seem to be cutting in and no, out. No, I'm okay. I had you on mute. Oh, gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, so welcome everyone to today's uh, office hours, our hometown. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, an overview of a couple things today. I'm going to share my screen here. Let me make sure I share the right screen. I think I'm sharing the wrong one right now. Yeah, those are my notes. Okay, so we're live with uh, office hours. We do this every Monday at noon uh, Eastern. And um, today I wanna just uh, start off like we always do, going over some of the latest news from our hometown. Uh, first of all, I wanna announce in two weeks, well, less than two weeks, uh, two weeks from last Friday on uh, September 18th at noon, we're gonna be doing a virtual conference on reverse publishing from WordPress to InDesign. And we've done this a couple times now. I think we, we did one other virtual conference. And of course, today's office hours is on uh, reverse publishing. Really, I think September is going to turn into the month of reverse publishing. I'm going to just be talking about it a lot in our newsletter, in several office hours, because we really believe that this is a huge kind of like paradigm shift for the news industry. If you could um, get used to this idea of doing things in reverse, your whole process could be much more efficient than it is now. You know, because if you think about it, what we're doing today is we're, you know, kind of putting a, what do you call it? A, <laughs> a, a round ball into a square hole or something. You know, we, we've taken this process that worked for print and then just kind of, thrown it up online. Um, and, you know, there's nothing, there, there's really nothing wrong with that. Um, a, a lot of our customers are going to continue doing that for a long time. And that's a large part of our business, you know, so I'm not going to talk that down, you know, in terms of the PDF uh, conversion to HTML. We're happy to do that as long as, you know, there's a need for that. But I think that there's a lot of publishers out there that are looking for you know, ways to do things differently, maybe get the content online a little bit quicker. I mean, that's probably in my mind, one of the biggest benefits is that reverse publishing turns the whole process on its head. And so your content is created on the website first and it can be published immediately on the website. That allows you to be more real time with your readers and, um, you know, just get, get stories out right away rather than waiting for the print edition to come out. And then what you can do at the end of the week, when you go to lay out the print edition, you just take it all from the website, bulk export it to InDesign and lay out your paper. And we're going to show you how that whole process works today. So that's that's a teaser a little bit for the, the virtual conference, but also an intro for today's office hours. OK, also in news, we've got the NNA convention coming up uh, at the uh, beginning of October, October uh, 1st through the 3rd. And uh, we're really excited about this. Just super proud to be part of this organization. And uh, we're going to be doing five flash sessions. 
which, uh, you know, is more than I, I ever expected to give, but I gave them a bunch of ideas for what I could talk about and they took me up on all of them. So we're going to be doing uh, rethinking paywalls for paid print newspapers, rethinking paywalls for free print newspapers. We did a virtual conference on that last week on Friday. We'll be doing it again um, with more detail. Uh, well, actually, it's going to be a slightly different presentation just because it's a different format. Um, so it will be new info. And then uh, that afternoon on that Friday, October 2nd, we'll, we'll be doing reverse publishing from website to InDesign. Uh, you're probably starting to see a pattern here. What I did is I came up with this schedule for NNA and then we just held our own virtual conferences on each individual topic. That was kind of just uh, part of my strategy for preparing for the, the NNA. Uh, so I didn't have to do it all last minute and come up with five different presentations. I, I spaced it out over time and tested things out. And at this point, we've done all four, except for the reverse publishing one, which is going to be in two weeks. So we've done three out of the five presentations already. Uh, so I, I'm just super excited to, to do these again at, for NNA. Another one that we did, the first one that we started out with in this series was producing high yield content from video interviews. And that's just a really cool topic to me. It's this idea that we could be using Zoom or GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar to be producing more live content and then turn that uh, video into multiple different forms of media. You know, you can export it um, as an audio file and upload that as a podcast. You could take uh, the video, upload it to YouTube, uh, you know, and then from YouTube, they have a function to export the transcript. So then you could get the text file. So that's two pieces of content from one. Uh, from the, you know, when you record these videos, every single webinar that we do is recorded. So then we're getting the live experience. That's a piece of content for your subscribers or your readers. And then you also get the video after, which is going to be part of your archives. So people can watch that video at any time. They don't necessarily need to be there in the, the live environment. So right there, that's, um, really four pieces of content from one hour long interview or, or a half hour, however long you do it. We do our interviews with publishers, but you know, I would say that a, a local newspaper could do it with you know, a town official, a local business owner. You could use this as a way to market local businesses, just interviewing with them. And actually that's something that uh, the Wilson County News has started doing on Facebook Live. I'm very impressed by their uh, consistency on that. It's, I think it's every Thursday at noon, I want to say, or maybe it's 11. Uh, they do this Facebook Live and they they go over the news. Uh, they, they go through the print paper that, you know, and as a publisher, you've got so much content to talk about. I mean, it's, it's so easy. Um, you don't have to come up with anything. You're already producing this stuff for the print edition. So you just got to talk about it in long form uh, on a video. And um, you've got a whole new channel of communication with your readers, you know, because people, their interests are diversifying. And uh, I think at the bottom, at the end of the day, we just want to be wherever our readers are. And some readers get their information, you know, they prefer podcasts as a way to get the news or they prefer video. And so if we can meet them there, you know, that's how we're going to be successful. And then the last one is talking about, and this is on the Saturday session. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. We did a virtual conference on this with Tom Lapis and Cecile Werman. Um, Cecile will be joining me for an interview in the paid uh, paywall session, but Tom will be joining me for the uh, donation strategy session. And uh, he was just super innovative through the whole shutdown, really was not timid about asking for donations and coming up with creative ways to raise money for the paper and for local businesses at the same time. He's a very, very creative guy. Uh, so we'll be hearing from him and uh, looking at what he's doing at Henrico Citizen. Okay, that was uh, a lot there. Now let's take a look at some other news and um, we'll, we'll be getting to the, the main topic of discussion in a minute, but I really just wanted to talk about paywalls for a second, just coming off of all these virtual conferences, the last two we did were on paywalls. Um, you know, this is just some really, really exciting news as far as uh, I'm concerned. When I actually started in this business uh, about 12 years ago, it was at a time when 
people really didn't know what to do with the internet, how to monetize it. Uh, and pe- a lot of people were really scared to launch a paywall. They thought that their readers would reject it and uh, just, you know, totally shun them online and their traffic would plummet and then they wouldn't be able to make uh, money on advertising. It was all a, a fear driven decision making process. But the New York Times led the industry back in 2011, okay, when they launched their paywall. So let me just read from this article. I think it's really well put what Jack wrote here because we've been monitoring the New York Times and for years, but they had a huge story in August that I want to tell you about. So let's go through this. Our hometown has been closely monitoring the success of the New York Times and their ongoing shift to a digital first platform. The effort began in earnest in 2011 with the launch of a digital paywall and has since expanded to the point where for the first time ever, here's the headline, total digital revenue exceeded total print revenue in the second quarter of 2020. Okay. Now, of course, second quarter was really the peak of the shutdown. Uh, You know, people weren't picking up papers, you know, so I think we'll see if this, this lasts, you know, if, if, digital con- continues to exceed print. I, I could see print coming back um, as we things begin to open up. Uh, one of the big things that they cited in this article was that there was a huge drop in single issue sales, but you know the, the print delivery was still there because you know people didn't necessarily cancel their print subscription because of COVID, um, but they were definitely picking up less copies because they were just weren't out. <laughs> it's just... It's just so amazing how this whole thing has just accelerated everything. And so what I see here is that this is indicative of the future. This is where things are going, where digital is going to eventually exceed print in revenue. And, you know, once it exceeds in revenue, you got I don't know uh, the exact numbers, but you got to assume that the profit margin is going to exceed uh you know, be much better than print. I mean, think about what are the costs to produce a website? You've got to pay, you know, the developers, um, the engineers, you know, people to to put up the content, but you're not printing, uh, in this case, hundreds of thousands, millions of papers a month, you know, so that cost just goes away. Um, And so, you know, this article goes into it in in great detail, uh, really well said here by Mark Thompson, the CEO. He says uh, the company's shift, he has called the company's shift from print revenue to digital a key milestone in the transformation of the New York Times. Okay, so as as it's uh, said in our blog post, um, you know, this is really about finding success in a digital first landscape where we're digital publishing on the web first. That's our you know, core product and the print is, you know, not secondary, but it's no longer the the core product, the website is. And this goes back, actually, this ties in very well with today's topic, because with reverse publishing, if you're using the website to create the articles, imagine this, before the whole shutdown and, uh, you know, a bunch of papers had to stop printing, uh, if they had been writing their articles on the website, then they could have just stopped printing for a few weeks or a month or however long it was, and it would have had no impact on the web. But because they're so print centric, we had papers that were still laying out their PDF edition as if they were going to print it, but then they just didn't send it to the printer because, you know, they they had to cut down on those costs because the advertisers went away. Also, there was all this, you know, people weren't touching papers. Um, People weren't picking them up. So if they had been in a position where they were writing the stories on the website first, then, you know, they, they could have adjusted their model uh, better. Um, I mean, they made the best decision they could in the situation that they were in. Nobody saw this coming, you know, this dramatic change in the whole newspaper business. But, I mean, it's it's been a long-term trend. It's been coming for a long time, uh, as, as long as I've been in this business, for sure. So... Let's take a look. Um, we got a couple interesting uh, videos here that I, I want to share. Let's see. Let's take a look at this one here. I, I kind of like, let's see if you can hear this. Digital revenue exceeds print for the first time for New York Times company. The pandemic squeezed advertising for the web as well as print, but subscription growth was the best ever for a quarter. This is a trend that we've seen coming for a long time 
but it has finally uh, come to pass at the New York Times. Let's read on and look at some of the numbers here. As much of the staff worked remotely, the Times brought in $185.5 million in revenue on the digital side. That includes subscriptions and ads during Q2 2020. The company announced this on Wednesday. The number for print revenue was $175.4 million. In terms of the number of subscriptions, the company added 669,000 net new digital subscribers making the second quarter its biggest ever for subscription growth. And as we saw in our uh, report last week, Q1 was also a record. So that's two quarters in a row that they're setting records for digital subscription growth. The Times has 6.5 million total subscriptions, a figure that includes 5.7 million digital only subscriptions, putting it on course to achieve its stated goal of 10 million subscriptions by 2025. In a statement, Mark Thompson, the chief executive, called the company's shift from print revenue to digital a key milestone in the transformation of the New York Times. That is true for every newspaper in the country. Attracting subscribers willing to pay for online content is a high wire act that practically every company in the news business is trying to pull off. We are seeing this, of course, with all of our local newspaper customers. The Times started charging for digital content in 2011 when, at, at that time, asking for news consumers to pay for what they read on their screens was uh, risky, and a lot of people were hesitant to even ask. Uh, but as Mr. Thompson goes on to say, we've proven that it's possible to create a virtuous cycle in which wholehearted investment in high-quality journalism drives deep audience engagement, which in turn drives revenue growth and further investment capacity. Really, really well stated, Mr. Thompson. And this is what we believe is the way forward for all newspapers. We've been saying this for decades, that digital subscriptions and reader revenue needs to be a core component of any uh, newspaper digital business model. And so this is what we're talking a lot about. Uh, we had a virtual conference on this last week on subject of rethinking paywalls, uh, you know, in the light of the pandemic and the shutdown and all the impact that it has had on advertising across the board, not just for the New York Times, every newspaper in the country is experiencing that kind of a, a shift in the revenue. And so you can come to our website, our-hometown.com and watch a full replay of last week's virtual conference. We basically cover all of the different paywall models that we're seeing at our customers' sites and go through some of the strategies that we've seen for them launching paywalls and growing the subscriber base. So go ahead and check that video out. It's completely free on our website. And today, what I really wanted to announce is our next conference, which is Rethinking Paywalls Part 2, where we're gonna be talking about the, some of the really innovative models we're seeing at free print newspapers. So the main message here is that even if you your print edition is free, you do not necessarily need to give away your content online. We are seeing more free print newspapers launching paywalls every day. And really, it, a lot of that comes from this point here, where, where I say in the description of this uh, conference, have you ever had a print subscriber call to cancel their free print subscription because they get all the news online for free anyway? This is becoming a common trend for publishers as their print audience continues to migrate online at the expense of the print newspapers, advertising reach and revenue. So we're gonna talk about how some publishers are capturing reader revenue they're creating metered paywalls in most cases. This is gonna be a slightly different conference than last week's because obviously it is different setting up a paywall for a pre, free print newspaper than a paid. You, you, you do wanna look at it differently, but you definitely wanna be looking at it and at least considering some type of a paywall or a registration wall. And so you can register for this conference. We're gonna be doing it September 4th at noon Eastern. Uh, that's a Friday please uh, go ahead, go to ourhometown.com slash virtual dash conferences to register. Uh, just put in your name and email and we'll send you a follow up and a reminder when the conference is gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna be a live broadcast. So there's a lot of interaction and opportunity for asking questions. 
So I really hope that you'll all consider joining us. And even if you can't make it at that time, go ahead and register and we'll send you a recording of the whole conference after we're done. My name is Matt Larson. I'm the president and CEO of our hometown where we help newspapers build websites and develop digital business models. Hope to see you at the conference. Yeah, so as I said, that conference has already happened, but you can still get the full recording. Uh, as I mentioned, um, just by going to our website, it's all there. Uh, let's see, did I? I didn't actually mention it yet. But that's because, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to be putting out the blog post for that tomorrow in the newsletter. So that's why. Um, so that'll be part of that. So you can watch the whole video. And uh, it went very well. I had a lot, a ton of discussion there. Uh, Vera, I don't know if you can uh, chat yet, but um, that that was that was more engagement than I've seen on any conference yet. I think maybe it was a little bit more of a, I don't want to say controversial topic, but it was less of a like obvious thing. Um, so some of the publishers were kind of saying like, well, you know, should we really be locking down all of our content? Do we want to give away the e-edition? Uh, we had a paper up in New Hampshire that was kind of uh, debating me on that a little bit. And I thought it was a very interesting conversation because of that engagement. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of good questions on that. Yes. Yeah. You had a lot of good questions too. Um, but I'm always really interested when someone comes to me, you know, cause every newspaper is so different and we work with, uh, a lot of different weeklies and, uh, you know, a handful of dailies and we see all these different models. So it's really tough to make a, a broad, statement like every newspaper should have a paywall and so i you know I, I expect pushback on that but i really do believe it there should be some type of a paywall even if it does give away uh, a good amount of the content still just to kind of keep that traffic up there you want to protect you want to have some premium content because there's always going to be people that will pay for that in your community you know you, you got to look at it like a bell curve uh, you know, in terms of what people are willing to pay. And so, you know, certain members of uh, the town council, you know, members of local government, you know, they're probably going to want to read every single story that's in the local paper. And maybe they prefer to do it online. So we want to give them that option, but we also need to fund it in a way that doesn't hurt the print edition, you know, because if, especially if you're paid in print, you could be hurting the print. But as we talked about in the conference, um, you could be hurting your print circulation by giving it away online, which then hurts your print revenue even more than it's already hurting. So, you know, we want to stop that. Um, okay, so that's enough on that. We've, we're talking quite a bit here about our hometown news. And so I'll be getting to reverse publishing in just two more tabs here uh, as we go down the line. Now, I just want to remind everyone that there has been an update to MemberPress. And uh, if you're using Stripe, I think the update was actually on the Stripe end. And so what needs to happen is if you see this message on your dashboard, MemberPress security notice, this isn't, you know, uh, some, some weird uh, hacker kind of thing. Like it's not a security notice in that way but it is an issue with Stripe. And so you need to fix this error. This is definitely something that needs to be done as soon as possible. So if you still have this notice on your website, please first just contact ops. You know, you can email ops at our-hometown.com and create a ticket. Um, but the whole process is detailed right here. There's basically two steps. We need you to go into your Stripe account and set our hometown, the email, ops email, to an administrator on your team within Stripe. Because right now we're probably just at the developer level, but we need the administrator access to fix this problem. And then once that's done, then you know either respond to the ticket that you started initially or create a new one and just uh, you know let us know that we've been invited and then we'll go in there and make the change. Okay? Pretty really easy thing to fix. It's just but it is an important thing to fix as soon as you can. All right. Last thing I just want to point out was last week's blog post. I really like this one. I was not even aware of a lot of these options for Ad Rotate Pro. 
Uh, it's pretty cool. But um, this plugin, as many of you know, is how we deliver the banner ads, the, uh, you know, a lot of the, the different uh, web only ads on the site, you know, the ads that click through directly to the advertiser website that you upload to the website yourself. These are different from the ones that we extract from the print edition. These are just for the online only versions. But if you come into Ad Rotate Pro, uh, what you'll find is this article is basically about different ways that you can kind of clean up the uh, Ad Rotate Pro ad uh, manager because it can get to be kind of messy. So if you go into your Ad Rotate Pro adverts and you see something like this, which is just like a ton of yellow, a lot of adverts that need attention, a lot of ads that have expired, you might want to think about going in there and cleaning that up. And uh, using these bulk options, it makes it really easy. Again, I didn't even realize these existed, but you can come in here and uh, do a bulk change. So uh, a couple of the things that you can do in bulk are deactivating ads. So you can select you know, 10 or 20 ads that are, uh, you know, expired or just need to be taken off the site and you can deactivate them. Uh, the second option is to archive ads. Now that's a great option for any ads that you think you might reuse in the future. This is a way to get them off of the main dashboard and the main plugin interface, but not delete them. So if you ever wanna uh, bring them back, they're always gonna be in your archive and uh, the best way to do it uh, at that point would be to duplicate the ad and then run it again because you don't want to just really keep using the, the same ad. I think it's good to just have that record of, you know, having this ad in the archive that ran for a year, you know, whatever, six months in 2020. But then if you want to use it again in 2021, you just duplicate it. So you still have that record of how long it ran before. What were the stats during that period? Those are all preserved in the archives. So then you can kind of compare it to the, the duplicate when you run it again. Um, but if you made a mistake on an ad or you, you know, for whatever reason, you just decide there's no way I'm ever gonna reuse this and you just wanna clear it out, you can move it to the trash. It will be deleted permanently after three days, but during those three days, you can actually pull it out of the trash. Okay, and then, um, Reset stats will reset all the recorded stats on a selected advert. And I'm not sure exactly when this would be useful, but you know it's it's there as an option. So let's say you ran uh, an ad uh, on spec for a week and um, you know hadn't actually sold it yet, and then you wanted to just clean, get a clean slate and and run the stats for real once they actually started paying or something like that. Uh, that might be useful there. OK, and just a whole bunch of different uh, tips in this blog post. I mean, quite, quite thoroughly written, uh, I got to say, Jack. And this idea actually came from Terry over in uh, customer support. So, you know, if you guys ever have questions on how to do things, please don't hesitate to send them to ops because a lot of those things eventually become blog posts. You know, this is these are things that we saw people asking uh, over and over again. So. Actually, Vera, did, I don't know if you got a chance to check out this article yet. Did you happen to read this? I don't know. Uh, if no, you... I haven't read it yet. Okay, I should put you on the newsletter list so you can get these things because this is, you know, great training stuff. So I just sent it to you in Slack. Um, you might want to take a look at it. It might be helpful in responding to tickets. But this is this I'll is take a very a look at it. Yeah, it's a very specific issue. You know, it's related to just basically cleaning up your ad rotate area. Um, not something that people necessarily complain about a lot. I think this is just usually something that Terry would see when she was training people. She'd be in their site and, you know, just point th these options out at that time. But, you know, we wanted to bring it to the forefront today and last week. Okay, let's do this thing. We are finally here, reverse publishing. This is what today's uh, Office Hours is really about. And as I said in the beginning, this is a concept for uh, you know, just changing your whole workflow. If you could write your stories on the website first, publish them in real time, and then bulk export them to InDesign, you would basically eliminate the need to update the website after the print edition is put out, which is how most newspapers do it. You know, a lot of newspapers will do it manually. They'll copy and paste stories from InDesign onto the website. 
Uh, but most of our customers use our full service PDF extraction where they just send us the print PDF and they're done. And that's why it's so popular. They can just hand it off to us and we handle the updating. And that's actually what we're doing for Wilson County News right now. And they're going to be my example because uh, the publisher there, Kristen Weaver, is considering moving to reverse publishing. And so I turned on uh, the feature for her because that's something that you know we're going to be announcing in tomorrow's newsletter. Uh, we're going to make this feature of reverse publishing available to all of our full service customers for no extra charge. As long as you're using our PDF extraction service, you will have uh, access to the reverse publishing tool. The reason we're doing that is because you, you're really never going to use both of them at the same time. It doesn't make sense to have us extract the stories from the PDF if you've already written them on the site, right? So we're, we're releasing it for all full service customers so that they can just see what it's all about. They can really uh, get their arms around it and, and just basically play around with it. And then if you decide that it is a, a tool that you want to use, you know, and you want your whole team to be using, then we can talk about migrating away from full service PDF extraction to reverse publishing. And that, you know, that'll be on your own schedule. There's no pressure here, but we just want to make this available so that, you know, people can really see how cool it is because I think, you know, once you see how it works and today I'm just going to paint the broad strokes. We're going to go into more detail in future office hours and on all the little details that uh, are available for making this, you know, work with whatever your process is. But I think hopefully there'll be a kind of a light bulb moment today for people listening because this is, I really believe this is uh, the way of the future for newspapers. So let's walk through it step by step. I'm going to go into the dashboard for Wilson County News and just kind of give you an overview here. So I guess the whole process really starts with writing your articles, okay? That's um, the first step is, is writing the article in WordPress. Now that's the change because you're probably writing a lot of your stories in Microsoft Word or Google Docs, but you could actually use the WordPress site for your composition because you can come in here and I'm not gonna save any of these articles uh, and I'm, you know, I'm really not going to demonstrate uh, publishing an article or anything because this is a, a live site. But if I were to come in here and create a new article, this could be this is just like a, a Word document. You know, I've got my title, which is like, uh, you know, the title of the document. I've got my body and I can drop my images in here. I can format it so that it looks exactly the way I want to on the website. You know, I can see a preview of it. And uh, it just gives me a lot more control of the way things appear online. And so, you know, basically rather than using a word processor that's, uh, you know, software downloaded on your machine, you can use this word processor that's in the cloud and is displaying uh, to your readers, uh, you know, is, is available to display to your readers at all times. So to boil it down a little bit more, this turns the website CMS into your Prepress and website CMS. You get two for one because you can write your stories for the print edition on the same platform as they're going to be displayed online. Okay, so the first step is writing my articles, and there's all kinds of cool tools in here for managing that workflow. For example, we can set, we can create custom um, draft or sorry, <laughs> custom statuses for your articles. So in this example, they haven't really customized this yet. So there's just the two default options. But we could create an option for, you know, at, at, let's say at Wilson County News, ready for Kristen's review. You know, that's the, the publisher editor there. So you could create a custom status for that. And then when you're working in here all day long, remember, everyone's now working in one place rather than having articles scattered all over on different computers and emailing each other. Word documents, everyone can see it in one place. And the, um, so she's not actually displaying the status because she's probably not using it, but we can uh, display the status on uh, this list here so that you could then filter. But you can always filter actually with this drop down. So I could come in here, let's see if she's got any drafts in here. She might not. 
Oh, she does have one draft. Okay, so that would be a way. Hopefully, you can kind of see how this would work because you have writers coming in here, creating drafts, not publishing them online, set the status to draft or ready for review. And then the editor can just come in here, filter to see all the draft articles, and then do their thing and make any changes or recommendations to the author on how to you know, make that article stronger. Um, does that make sense, Vera, that part? Just using? Yes, it does. Okay. So now you have a question, though. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I didn't mean to inter interrupt, but okay. it tags on to Friday where uh, people were emailing. You'll see those as drafts also. Right, right, right. Yeah, if you're using the email to post feature, uh, then yes. It, that is actually a setting within email to post. So you can have it um, set those articles as drafts, which would probably be the best way to do it. So that every article coming in from email goes into the CMS. It shows up in this list just like all the others. So it, it's like it's as if it was created in the CMS directly, but it's set as a draft automatically. So then, uh, yeah, that's probably the way to do it. Because when you're emailing articles in, you know, you just write something off on your phone really quick. It's probably not, you know, necessarily ready for prime time. It's it's it might need a, a little bit of tweaking. So, you know, you can have your people in the field at the game, you know, reporting the scores. They could be sending uh, an email to post. And what you could do, actually, probably a good process for this would be to email it into the website, but then copy the editor or someone that, you know, is at the paper that's like on at, at their desk and copy them on the story. So then they see, okay, they just submitted one to the website as a draft. I'll, I'll go in there now and, uh, you know, maybe uh, clean it up a little bit. Maybe, fit, you know, maybe the email to post just has like the scores and just like some of the plays and, you know, it's not really a, a fully completed article. And then the editor can go in there, clean that up and then publish it on the website right then. Um, so, you know, once it's in the website, you have full control of whether it's a draft or, or published or not. Okay. That's a really good point. It's a good, good, good connection. Any other questions so far, Vera? No, it's pretty straightforward. That was the only one I had. Okay. Let me check and see if any of the attendees have questions. I don't think I've seen any pop up yet. Um, so that's good. So let's keep moving on here. So now... We've got our articles in the website, and uh, some of them are live, some of them are still drafts. And that's the other thing I want to point out. Meg Norris does this in a very specific way. She does not publish the articles on the website until the print edition comes out. And I do see the logic to that, for sure. If it's uh, it, For her, I think it's, it's about protecting the print edition which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But you could be publishing stories in real time. If they're like a breaking news story that you just need to get out right away, maybe I'm sure she breaks that rule sometimes. But for the most part, she has these waiting in here all week long until I think, let's say, I forget exactly when she publishes, but I think it's on Thursday. Let's say she's laying out the paper on Wednesday. Um, you can have the articles in here as drafts, but then you can have them scheduled to go live. So let's take a look at that. We talked about this in another uh, office hours. You can schedule an article to go live right after the print edition goes out. So, you know, let's say your, your paper hits the stands uh, Thursdays at 8 a.m. You know, you can have these articles go live on the website at the same time. So then um, it's kind of like your whole publication is released at once. It's, it's, it's a neat way to do it. Okay, so then let's get back to this page, um, the uh, article list. So I've got all my articles in here. Now let's say I'm at the point on Wednesday night where I need to lay out the paper. What I'm gonna do is go down to this plugin, which again is gonna be available to all full service customers uh, starting this week uh, for no additional charge. As long as you're using our PDF extraction, you'll get this to experiment with. And uh, you're going to get to come in here and play with all these features. So when you go to the reverse publishing tab, it, you have this screen. And we've got a couple different options. I can choose what edition to export. 
because we're always going to still want to be categorizing the articles on the website by edition just to keep things organized. So then I can choose the upcoming edition. I'm just going to do an old one because she is still using full service. So she doesn't have, I don't think she, well, she does have some articles from the 16th, but I don't think it's going to be a complete edition. So I'm just going to use an old one. So you can export the whole edition at once. You can export individual categories. So let's say you just want to lay out the front page or the obits page or something. You could just export articles that are in those categories. And just, you know, if you're doing it more piecemeal, I think that makes sense. And these kinds of details really show just how flexible this thing is. You can apply it no matter what your paginator style is for laying out the paper. There's a way to make it work with this export tool. Okay. Uh, we don't really need to talk about those different options. But down here, we've got the character styles and paragraph styles. So this is pretty neat because what we can do here is we can take the, the styles that we have set in InDesign and put them in these fields. And then the export tool will assign those styles as tags to the content as it's exported. And then when you import it into InDesign, it automatically applies those styles, okay? So you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. It's very powerful when you see it uh, actually happen. So let's just get to that. So now I've got my edition selected. I've got my paragraph style set. I could also do character styles, but I don't need to do that today. We'll just do an export. So when I hit that export button, it's gonna download a zip folder. Okay, because there's a lot of stuff in here, so it's got to be in a zip folder. It's uh, and, and it's also in a folder, so that, that's why we do it as a zip. So I'm just going to double click that, and in a second, it unpacks that zip, and I've got all my content here from this edition. So these are a whole bunch of images. Basically, this folder is composed of images, and then there's one other file in here, a very important file which is the XML file, okay? And it has the date in it, so you, you can clearly find this. So let's just see, we've got this big folder, it's from the 2028, 20, 26 edition. Now let's jump over to InDesign. Okay, I've got my template here, and uh, I'm always interested to know, I think a lot of papers do follow a similar template each week for you know the, the homepage and different sections. Some people lay it out fresh every week. So, you know, your process at this point may differ a little bit than what I'm gonna show you, but I'm just assuming I have a basic template ready. Then I just go to File, Import XML. Okay, now I have to find that addition, which is gonna be in my Downloads folder. Okay, and that was 826, right? Now, if I open this up, I'm now running this function of importing XML. So all these JPEG images are not gonna be clickable. So you really can't make a mistake here. All you gotta do is go down to the one thing that is clickable, which is that XML file. Okay, and now XML looks like this. It's just a bunch of tech or code, really. It's text uh, with uh, tags, um, you know, different things that look kind of like HTML. So, uh, and that's because XML is like a variant of HTML or vice versa, rather. HTML is kind of like a, a branch of XML. So we have all this information from the website. And so we're just basically exporting it in um, this bulk form. So when I say open, I'm gonna wanna merge the content in all cases, I would say. You can also append it but then you're gonna get duplicate articles. So I would recommend merging all the time because what we can do now is we have the whole edition here, the current state of the website for this edition. But if I make a change to any of these stories, then I just simply do that XML export again, then I merge it in InDesign and then it will just replace the first story. So you know if there's some error, a person's name is spelled wrong or something like that, you can make the change on the website and then update it and sync it up with what you've already laid out in print. So I'll actually sh probably show you that today. Um, that'll be kind of a cool demo. So let's see here. If we go to, and stop me at any time here if you have questions, but 
Um, there was a cool article in here that had a bunch of things that I wanted to show. Oh, wait, no, that, that was from a different edition. So that's okay. We'll just do this totally blind. I haven't actually tested this. Now, here's my template. I've got an area for the title. I've got my body. And then I've got a graphic. So let's see how this all works. First of all, I dra drag the title in. Okay. And now I drag the body. Now, that's a pretty short story. But um, notice how there are different font sizes. And I, all I did was drag that in. That is the paragraph styles at work. Okay, so if I look at my my paragraph styles here, I'll go to table or wait, what is it? Window styles, paragraph styles. These are gonna match. Where'd that show up? It showed up on my other screen here. Hold on. Let me get this over here. Okay, so now I've got heading one. That is a paragraph style that has already been set in InDesign, and that matches the title uh, tag. So it applied heading one to the title that in the XML file, and then it was able to automatically apply that style because it had that tag on it. So that headline came in, and it, it already looks perfect. And then uh, the same thing with the text. That's set to 10-point font. You could set it. You know, any kind of paragraph or character styles that you have in your InDesign templates, you can you know, automatically apply those with this process. OK, does that make sense, Vera? It does, yeah. OK, now let's do the last thing. If I want to lay out the graphic, I've only got one image in this story, so I'm going to open that up, drag in the graphic, and there it is. So this story looks great, but you know what I might do? Uh, maybe it actually fits this other section a little bit better. So I can just, now watch this. I want to point something out. Um, I've got a couple stories here, this one and then one above it, okay? I don't know if you can see this. It's really small. It's probably even smaller on your screen, but there's a little blue dot in the corner of these elements for this story. OK, the story about um, the coach. So if I have already placed an element, it's going to have that blue dot next to it. This story has not been placed, so it doesn't have those dots. But if I want to move this story, the way to do it is just to go back to this XML console here and drag in that title again, but put it in a different area. And it just automatically moves it for me because InDesign is smart enough to not place the same story twice. It's going to help you avoid that. Now, I want to move the body too. This is going to fit a little bit better over here. And look at this. Now, what I actually have to do in this case is I, I need to tell InDesign to link these two boxes because I hadn't told it before. They were just separate boxes that were set up on the template. So now I've made that connection. And it looks like the story keeps going on because it's got a red dot, red plus there. So, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't do it like that, but, you know, I might uh, extend this on page five or something. So, you know, I could take this little bit extra and um, whoops, put it, put it on another page. OK, I'll just put it right there for now. <laughs> we'll put it, place it somewhere else later. And then lastly, the image, I got to replace that down here. So great. That looks better. It fits this section a little bit more. And then. You know, the template is just that. It's just a template. So what I could do at this point, because uh, the image is a portrait, I could adjust things a little bit here to make it fit better. Um, I could drag this over to make room. And, you know, I don't know if this is going to quite fit. But, you know, at this point, you're using your graphic design skills I'm sure whoever does your paper is much better at this than I am. I'm definitely a novice at InDesign. But, uh, you know, you just kind of tweak your template so that it fits the actual content. So something like that is how I would lay out this first story. Uh, and actually, it looks like the, the headline uh, is a little big for uh, this area. So let's see if I can just change um, the font on just this one headline. Okay, Coach Lester Jackson. Okay, something like that. 
So, you know, these presets are just going to help you get close. And, you know, and I think for a lot of these headlines, let's take a look at this one here. Um, I want to get another one with an image. Not all these have images. Okay, this one does. If I drag that title in there, it, that that one's still a little bit big for this area, but I can make adjustments, you know, as we discussed. Uh, let's see if I grab my pointer tool, make this a little bit larger. See, now, now the headline fits there a little bit better. But, um, you know, the other way you can do it is, again, just to change that uh, font size. Sidewalk work continues, something like that. And then we've got, you also have bylines in here. So if there's a byline on the website, that'll come through. Body, okay, and so that one just laid out and it automatically uh, extended it to the next uh, column there. And look at this, I can actually export the caption of the image. So let's bring the image in first. Okay, now adjust this box a little bit. I'm gonna make room for a caption here. So let's add another box underneath the picture. And these all are things that you probably have in your template, but I didn't think ahead on this one. So then I can drag my caption in there, okay? So I just laid out two stories just by doing drag and drop. I think another benefit of this workflow is that you're not going back and forth between different programs, you know, going to your Microsoft Word, going into email to download, uh, an article that was sent to you from a reporter, you know, they're all in the website. So you can just access them in, in one shot. We, we bulk export it and then it's all right here. So, you know, really this, this could streamline things a lot for your paginator. And as the editor or the publisher, you can just, you know, make the decision that, okay, all these articles look good on the website. They're ready for print. You could export the XML zip folder yourself and then just email that zip folder to your paginator. Um, or, you know, they could go in and pull it out themselves, either way. But it just makes the whole thing very portable, very flexible for any workflow. Okay. Any questions, Vera? That's pretty much the broad strokes of the process. We'll get into more details in future office hours on little things uh, that you can tweak with that workflow, but that's that's basically it. No, I, I'm actually quite impressed with the tool. When I used to build yeah. a paper, there were so many different hoops to go through. This is quite simple. Yeah, so that means a lot coming from you. So you have you were the paginator. Was that at Trader's Guide or was that a different paper? Nope, it was that Trader's Guide. I built two papers. I had the Trader's Guide and the Penny Savers that I had to do. Right. And I couldn't do them all at the same time. I had to do one and then the other. There were slight differences. But the program mm -hmm. we used, you just you, you had to use the template and try to squeeze things to make it fit. But um, right. there was a lot of handcrafting as well. This right here, you just drag and drop. It's so simple. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's as simple as it it can possibly get but you know if you want to really get into the design i mean there's some beautiful newspapers out there that do all kinds of crazy things with graphics uh you know i don't know what the terms are for them necessarily but they really get into the design and you can still do that stuff but this is for getting the bulk of the content on there making sure it matches what's on the website so everything's in sync and you know, just making it as simple as possible to, you know, so you're not even copying and pasting anymore. It's just the drag and drop. So there's very little room for error. Um, so that that means a lot coming from you. I appreciate that feedback. And I'm glad that you, you have seen this now um, a couple times. You saw it on the virtual conference. But, you know, definitely if you have any ideas on how to make this better, I'm all ears. And the same goes for anyone on the call all of our customers, we want to make this as useful and as versatile as possible. So um, really, really, uh, we're, we're, we're totally open to that. This is not like a uh, set in stone type of thing. It's, um, it's still an evolving product, and we expect it to continue to evolve 
as the uh, the needs of the industry keep changing. But um, that's that's basically it. Now I, I said I was going to show you how to make a change, but I think I'm going to save that for a future conference. So that's actually probably a whole nother 15 minute demo of just showing you how you could make a change on the website and then uh, a, you know merge that change with the the print edition. So you know we're actually running out of time here. So that's actually a, a perfect little teaser for next week. I think I'll I'll kick it off with that next week. And then uh, I believe on the schedule I'm also going to be talking about how we reverse publish classifieds. So that is very exciting to me because that's a real additional, you know, incremental revenue opportunity that you could have on your newspaper. Because if right now you're publishing your classifieds in the print edition only, that's great. But we could also be generating revenue through the website 24-7. You know, uh, people can place their orders on the website and then you could reverse publish them to print just, you know, the same as we did for the articles. It's it's a slightly different interface. It's a different plugin that you would use for that. But think about it. I mean, then that's going to open up all this opportunity for you because now you could do online only classified ads and it could just be, you know, maybe a, a lower price point, um, something that doesn't have any kind of a deadline. Forget the lower price point thing. It could be the same price point. But the advantage of it is that if someone has missed the print deadline, they've got a garage sale coming up this weekend, they've got to get the word out, they could run an ad just on the website, but it would be the same process for them if they were to place a print ad, okay? You know, they could go in to this order form and just check the box for print and online, and now they're going to get on the website and in the print edition just by doing one order, and this cuts down on the paper's labor. You know, they don't need to take the order over the phone anymore. They don't need to be uh, even available. They don't even need to be in the office to collect these orders. Like I said, the order form will be online all the time. And a lot of people do these things in the middle of the night. You know, they're, they're not doing them when they're at work or working from home um, because they're working. So, you know, that's when the newspaper is is waiting to take orders. So if we could open that up and uh, just make it self-service, you know, there could be additional revenue there for the online uh, classified system. So we'll get into that in a much more detail next week, but I'm excited about it. It's a, it's a program that we developed very uh, closely with a group out in California, um, the Acorn group, because they, they had this vision for, I want, you know, right now their classified section is just a bunch of text ads. It's just in print. But the publisher there is like, I want to get images in there. I want to get colored images. I want to be able to take those orders from the website. And so over the last couple months, we've developed this program with him where he can now get his uh, images from orders placed on the website. He can get those into the print edition. And I mean, if you think about it, what sells something better than an image? You know, you got to see the thing, the the days of just describing your products, like the motorcycle you have for sale, the car you're trying to get rid of. I mean, who's going to you're just going to get way more responses for, uh, you know, people interested in the car if they can see how it looks. So to get images in your classified system, this will help you do that. Um, so that's that's all kind of um, part of the, the whole reverse publishing feature. So we'll get into that next week and perfect timing. Dan, we, we nailed it, Vera. Look at this. It's one o'clock and uh, I think I covered everything I wanted to today. Do you have any other questions for me right now or anyone on the call? Type your questions in now, please. But uh, Vera, anything you got? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fascinated about the classifieds because that was the Church's Guide bread and butter there. I'm eager to <laughs> yeah. see how that works. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to your feedback on that, too. Yeah, for sure. Any ideas that you have for that? Uh, that one is even newer than this. This one we've had for a couple of years um, and it's it's in production. The classifieds reverse publishing is also in production with a handful of customers, but um, it's really just a, a few that have taken us up on it. So, again, we're just trying to get these ideas out there and uh, you know get some more use out of them. 
So I think we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you all so much for joining me. This uh, whole recording will be available on our website. Uh, should be tomorrow. I know it'll also go out in the newsletter. So uh, looking forward to um, your feedback on all this. And uh, thank you very much, Vera, for taking the time on Labor Day to join me. I appreciate it very much. Oh, thank you for having me. I learned so much. I really am excited about it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, me too. That's why I didn't want to skip it today. Uh, I thought about rescheduling, but uh, I, I think it, it's better to just stick to a, a regular office hours. So um, cool. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you later then. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. But I'll talk to you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Vera. Thank you. Bye.